um, it's actually true that your energy, your uh, presence, your compassion influences the speaker. That's, uh, that's simply the truth of the situation. I also want to take my hat off to all of you because you're empowering yourself. You're actually showing up, you're learning, um, you want to get better. And I think that's, that's absolutely the starting place for making this remarkable recovery or radical remission or, or just being healthier and happier. And so um, I'm really touched that you guys stayed with us. And for the people who are going to watch this afterward as well, it actually happens retroactively. So again, thank you for, for watching this. Um, this is the last of an eight part series. I've tried to go into detail into the multiple realms of how we can profoundly influence your health in the previous sessions. I want to bring this together in one session through story, through more like the attitude. It's like, if you can figure out the why, then the how will manifest itself. Uh, and so I really want to get to this kind of heartfelt base of deep healing and transformation that ultimately can influence the physical side of, of your recovery. Um, so take home points. What I want you guys to consider and ultimately to manifest within your life, if that's what you want to do. Firstly, healing takes work. The radical remission cases, Kelly Turner, Jeffrey Redinger, the psychiatrist from Harvard, Alistair Cunningham, they're all saying the same thing. The people that are involved in their own healing, their own um, journey actually can, can have a profound influence, but they need to actually do the work. You need to take care of yourself. You need some time to reflect. You need to have some contemplation time so you can reflect and tap into that inner guidance. It's there for you, right? I think it's remarkable. I think it's the first aspect of miracle that something deep within you wants you to heal, wants you to get strong, wants you to, to, to get better in some way or form, heal your life. Uh, and so when we ask and listen, ultimately the answer's there that can guide you into what's best for your situation. So there's no one best way is the other way to, to listen to that. Um, and lastly, the, uh, the takeaway is radical remissions happen and you can profoundly influence your health and happiness. There's always that possibility. You're not a statistic, you're a person and uh, there can be a home run for your situation. So why not live your life fully? Why not go for it? And I mean, it's, it's one holographic picture, right? You take care of yourself at a very deep level and those physical manifestations can happen. So I had put this series together, recognizing that people have different goals. Uh, and I think it's very important to be conscious and deliberate about what you're trying to manifest within your life. Be very clear in terms of message to yourself, meta message to yourself. So you can maximize your chance of recovery, or you can maximize your longevity. Uh, you know, you can potentially have a, a home run and live for another 45 years, 50 years. Secondly, I think people struggle with a cancer diagnosis because it causes so many um, emotional difficulties. And that's the normal, natural things. And we humans don't like to feel lousy. And therefore, we can profoundly influence our emotional life. And when you get yourself into that space, then you're tapping into the healing potential, right? So it's like, allowing the vulnerability, the emotional energy to flow through you so that you release the healing potential. So you feel better and you're healthier. Ultimately, people want to function better. They want to be able to think more clearly. Um, they want to do the things that they enjoy doing. They want to manifest their spirit through physical and cognitive ability. Ultimately, I think it actually boils down to this. So this is kind of one of the home um, key points is that your relationship is actually the most important thing. And it's the relationships with others. Those are so extremely important. We manifest our spirit so that we can connect deeply with others, but we can also connect deeply with ourselves and we can connect deeply with something bigger than ourselves. So as we take care of ourselves, as we set a determination to heal, ultimately the highest goals can be manifested in your life. And lastly, you can see this as earth school. 
right? That this is the opportunity to grow psychologically and spiritually. And when you do that, then your physical health gets better and you're happier. So it's one, really one big picture. This has been a 30 year quest for me. It's essentially going to be a lifelong quest. When I was in medical school, I didn't know what kind of physician I wanted to be. And I started out thinking about being a psychiatrist and I'd work with people with addictions as well. And then this book kind of fell off the shelf into my hands. Love Medicine and Miracles. Bernie Siegel is um, a cancer surgeon, worked in, in Yale, which is Ivy League uh, medical school. Um, and Bernie's so, so tapped into spirit. He really started talking about, um, you know, love. Like what's most important within one's life is to love fully. And um, he noticed that he, the patients that it did exceptionally well, he called this exceptional patients, uh, had certain attributes and um, um, that that really got me started on this whole path of how is it yes we can have the physical care within the medical system but what else can people do at levels of body mind and spirit what's the empowerment piece which has been this whole series right what's the empowerment piece how is it that the exceptional patients do exceptionally well and I've been learning around this for a very very long time and one of the attributes is um, that of acceptance. And we've talked a little bit about it before, but I want to share uh, the story because I read that book in the late 80s and I really didn't kind of understand it until probably 2006. And that was the kind of a personal situation that really sunk into the core, like no longer understanding intellectually, but understanding fully. And it's the story of... Um, a young woman who was a medical in medical school with me, Karen and I were quite close in medical school. We parted ways afterwards, and then we kind of reconnected when our kids uh, were young. And so it was like a once a year Christmas that'll we share the kind of funny stories from our lives. And um, Karen wrote me an email in 2006, and she said, uh, "Rob, can you please give me a call?" And I immediately assumed that somebody in her you know, family or friends had a cancer diagnosis and they wanted to talk about um, uh, you know, what they could do to empower themselves. And I got on the line and her, her, her husband actually said, no, it's actually Karen who has the cancer diagnosis. So she had found a lump in her breast and in her armpit. And within 30 seconds, she knew that she had locally advanced breast cancer. By that point, she had had a biopsy uh, you know, she had a three-year-old and a six-year-old uh, children at that point. And so by the time she got on the line, my, my, like there was kind of a frog in my throat, like tears welling up in my eyes and so on. And I was really incredulous at how incredibly calm and clear thinking she was in terms of what was happening, what she needed to do and so on. Um, and I asked her about it. She was very pragmatic. She, uh, you know, she was able to kind of see the situation and, and her friends thought she was kind of giving up because she was just like so, so solid, so um, grounded in her approach. And finally, she had to write an email to all her friends to explain her situation, how she had kind of gone through the psychological transformation of the acceptance piece, because we're talking about acceptance. Like her friends would say to her, oh, we know we're going to beat this diagnosis. And uh, she'd say, okay, well, that's a really nice thing to say, but you know what? We don't know what's going to happen in the future. So she's just so clear thinking. Finally, she uh, emailed all her friends and family to kind of explain um, what was happening. And it's around this piece of acceptance and the acceptance of her own potential mortality. It's kind of the elephant in the room. And so I'll just read from our book. So it's the book, The Healing Circle, which includes the remarkable stories of people who've attended the weekend retreats, as well as the teachings from the weekend. So this is the email that, part of the email that Karen emailed to her friends. She wrote, but once I managed to accept that the reality of my mortality had always been there, I could accept that nothing fundamental in my life had really changed with this diagnosis. I'm still the same me. My life has not changed drastically or dramatically. I'm still here. I was not hit by a bus. My loved ones are still around me. And unbelievably, I can honestly say that I'm as happy now as I was five weeks ago. I am, even in this moment, missing a body part or two, hair about to fall out, completely and utterly whole. 
she writes. And this allows me to see that the last few weeks and the year ahead as the first steps towards rather than a plunge from true wellness. I, I usually, I usually skip, skip, skip to the next section, but I was reading this this morning and I thought, oh, there's, there's some actually really good juicy stuff here as well. So I'm just going to read a little bit more from the email. And she said, she talks about the kind of the, the positives, but she also says, of course, it is not a bed of roses. While I really feel very little in way of fear for myself, I'm constantly thinking about my children. There is no positive spin to put a scenario of two small children losing their mother. That part is so painful to me to contemplate that I cannot go there for very often nor for very long but it does make me ensure that I give them the best of me that I can right now, that I love them with all the intensity that I feel. It also steals my resolve to fight this disease with everything I can. I will accept any treatment that shaves even a fraction, a percentage point off my chance of recurrence. And God forbid, if recurrence occurs, any treatment that will give me a single extra day, I'm planning and working towards living until they have to send me to a nursing home at age 95 and I can make them feel guilty for not visiting me often enough. Right. So you're getting this kind of acceptance, but there's this sense of determination at the same time. If it, again, this is the paradox or the and both uh, phenomenon. And I'll just read uh, the ending part. I suffered a couple of days of despair after the diagnosis, which is unusual. Most people are freaked out of their tree for a good month. Right. But since then, I've come to know that I will be okay. Maybe not okay in the way that I would have defined five weeks ago, but in a bigger sense. I felt that while I cannot be positive that I will beat this, I can be positive that I will have the courage to face what is ahead. I'm positive that I'll have the support from loved ones, the expertise from my doctors, and ultimately the grace from God to ensure that this turn in the road will not be a negative force in my life. And I believed all that and still believe that from deep within my soul. But in the past two weeks, something else has crept in. Right? So now you're going to feel the tension. You're going to feel the paradox. I'm starting to believe or want to believe that I will beat this in the conventional sense. I'm starting to demand it of myself and to ask it of God. There is a proportion of women who survive breast cancer in my stage. So why not me? Again, peace, acceptance, and determination. It's, it's an and both. Karen's alive and well, by the way, uh, 14 years later. We chatted with her, I don't know, six months ago. Her kids are going to university, all that stuff. So, um, or about to go to university, the youngest one. Um, it's this ability to do the holding the tensions. And the tensions can be living in this moment, and planning for the future. The tension can be between loving yourself as you are right now and wanting to grow spiritually and psychologically. The tension can be understanding that we're all foibled and follies and that we can be proactive, right? You can be accepting and proactive in your care at the same time and live your life fully with that go back to sharing. So that was the first, first, um, first deep lesson around acceptance. And Bernie also talked about this, um, this paradox of not worrying about what was going to happen in the future, but putting your energy in the things that you can control, right? Like Karen, loving her kids in the moment, she can call that she talked about you know, your attitudes, your belief, your actions, what you can control and you put yourself into that space. I think there's a physiology here of, of love and connection and really deep meaning. When you kind of tap into that, that's the physiology that's sent into the body, either physically through kind of stress reduction or metaphysically through consciousness that allows the miracles to happen. So, um, I've also been uh, taking you through Kelly Turner's book on radical remission. So Kelly's the PhD researcher who interviewed about 80 people who had undergone a spontaneous remission or, you know, one of those where the medical system said you have no chance and they recovered miraculously. 
Uh, and she subsequently interviewed about 200 of these, you know, looked at the, the literature. There's at least a thousand uh, published cases of spontaneous remission. And again, she noted that there were certain key factors. So people did the work. It's the takeaway. They'd actually spend the time to help heal themselves. And yes, within the context of we have other responsibilities and so on, but they took their healing journey seriously. And in fact, you can bring that sense of purpose into everything you do, whether it's, you know, being a mother or, you know, no particular job that you're doing that may not be that, you know, fun, but you know, you're doing it for a good reason, right? So Kelly's nine factors, in fact, there's the 10th factor. So she subsequently said that, yeah, the, the, um, as people become conscious of exercise as a very important aspect of manifesting healing, and there's so many ways that exercise uh, helps, um, that that factor actually started to come out in the literature. So it was, it was common amongst the survivors. So the survivors did their research, found out what was good for them, and actually did it, right? So there's exercises uh, number 10. So the classic nine from Kelly's side, that that proactive piece. So Karen did everything. She had her chemotherapy. She had her radiation. She went through reconstruction. I think she was on hormone treatments for at least five years as well. Uh, but she was proactive in getting, making sure she was doing every aspect of it. So uh, including the mind body piece, she ate well, she exercised, she made sure her weight was reasonable and so on. Ultimately, it's also about knowing that there's something within you that can guide you right? Something wants your healing. It's just, it's miraculous in that side. And it's that inner wisdom. And when you can settle yourself down, you release your stress, you begin to resonate, you'll be able to listen to that quiet, quiet, but profound voice. Radical change in diet. We talked about this as a whole seminar, like anti-inflammatory, nurturing your body, like you love your body, right? Reducing the uh, immune system issues uh, through a diet. Use of herbs and supplements. I actually don't think, well, I mean, each, each to his own, but I don't think this one is important. There was no herb or supplement that was common amongst the radical remission survivors. I think it had more to do with the fact that people were being proactive and doing the research and following what they felt was best. So that's a, a sub theme of taking control of your health. We talked about um, uh, working with our emotions and facilitating or creating circumstances in which we can feel joy and connection with other people. So the emotional aspect of this, um, very, very important. Uh, again, it's that sense of releasing the healing potential by not letting anything kind of drain, drain you from that. It's like al allowing the, the river to flow freely, whether it's negative or positive emotions. It's like, it's a normal thing. You don't have to fight it. You don't have to add extra stress to yourself. What I didn't do in the last eight weeks um, is talk about the importance of social support. Um, we humans are so connected. And even it says, one of the goals that Kelly talks about in her book is actually the idea that the idea is not to feel alone. Right? So even joining this webcast or watching this webcast, knowing there's other people there, you recognize it's that kind of transformation from a spiritual perspective to say, oh, poor me, this like my pain, my problem, this kind of constricted feeling to, oh, this is what people who have a cancer diagnosis go through. It's like seeing your journey as the human experience, as an expanded uh, perspective. And, you know, reaching out to other people, whether you're asking for help or receiving, uh, sorry, uh, giving help or receiving help releases oxytocin, it's healing to you. Um, you know, even physical touch is important. Th those things are part of our fabric. And so we can tap into that. And we need to, I think one of the advice I would give you is share your diagnosis with those people who in, in your life who can actually uh, hear you, right? And so I think about doing an email blast when my mom died of a brain tumor, I did a, an email blast to, you know, all my, uh, my colleagues and said, um, you know, this is what's happened. And uh, I'm going to continue to be at work for these weeks, and so on, please continue to joke with me and so on. So it's like sharing your story and being heard and understood, I think, is is healing by itself. So find that wise person in your life. 
deepen this spiritual connection we talked about. And um, today I'm going to talk about the, the ninth factor, the tenth factor on this page, which is having a strong reason for living. And uh, I would actually put that one right up top. I would put that right at the start of your healing journey. What's, what's the why in your life? How is it that you can manifest that meaning and purpose and aim your energy in the most appropriate ways? And that's typically through relationships as well. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk around this, uh, this point. Let's see where we are in the uh, next one down. So in Kelly's uh, work, uh, at first... She thought that the, um, the qualitative piece was people saying, I don't want to die. Like, I really don't want to die. But then she understood that that was more of kind of a fear-based perspective. And she began to hear it more clearly as her remarkable survivor saying, I want to live. And I'm just going to stop share for a second here. And I'm just going to read just part of the, the page here because I think... Um, I think this is so important. These people did not so much have a fear of death as a zest for living. In fact, a few of them were completely unafraid of death, seeing it not as nothing more than a transition to a different existence, which would happen whenever it was meant to happen. Until it happened, though, these people were very excited about the things they still wanted to do while they were alive. Right? So that's a different attitude than just trying to avoid death. It's like, I want to live so much. And you put your energy and your vitality and your spirit into those aspects. That, that releases the healing potential for them. Okay. PowerPoint share. So I want to live. It's not the same as I don't want to die. Kelly said that... Um, that she, she felt like this, this feeling like, oh, I want to live was coming from something that was deep, like soul level of the being, the deepest core of the being. And in fact, her remarkable survivors had this kind of sense of confidence. Yes, I want to live and I can influence this, influence this deal. I have my own ability to heal is there for me, right? So it's that kind of, it's a deep felt feeling that they draw on. And then I'll also reflect on this idea of healthy denial. So um, you get a, a more aggressive cancer diagnosis. I would say the healthy part of the healthy deny is to make sure you're getting the best medical care, that you have all your financial stuff in order, that you, you know your people in your life are, know what's happening. So it's kind of like being truthful and realistic, you know, planning for the worst, hoping for the best. So you kind of do those practical things and then you just let it go. Like let go of the worries around that part and live as if you're going to live. Right. And so it's like, if people talk to you, you'd be like, Oh, well, that person seems like they're in denial because they're so positive and so happy with their life. Uh, in the meantime, you've taken care of what you need to take care of and you might as well live from that, that space. So it's neither stoic, like you're just trying to, you know, muster a brave face, nor definitely is it helpless, right? So there's a proactivity part of it. So it's that feeling like, yes, I want to live. The other thing that she talked about in this uh, um, chapter is this idea that our minds and our attitudes, our beliefs profoundly influence our body. Right. And it's if, if you want to kind of use the Chinese medicine perspective, it's when you have that kind of feeling like, yes, I want to be there for my grandkids or I want to, I want to do this. It's like, oh, and it rises the energy and it invites in that kind of universal chi energy into the body. So that can kind of heal the body from a physical uh, perspective. I, I, she said, finding your calling. I want to expand that because I don't think it's like, mm, I have to now change my career or I have to, you know, um, you know, do something extraordinary. It's more like, how do I want to live my life? So the calling can be um, more generalized to how is it that I want to live my life? Um, and like Bernie Siegel, Kelly's talking about this idea that the cancer diagnosis allows you to reprioritize. It allows you to, um, 
you know, choose a new, start over again. Remember what's most important. Come back home to your priorities. So you can reprioritize to changes how you want to be and allowing creativity to come into your life more. So less of a shutdown and more of a kind of an opening uh, feeling. And it's really, to me, it's like the Mary Oliver quote, how do you want to live your one wild and precious life, right? So whether you've got another two years to go or another 52 years to go, how do you want to live these next six months, this next couple of years? And should it matter? Should it really matter whether you got 52 years to go or two years to go? How do you want to be? How do you want to connect? What's most important to you? And then be deliberate about that. Set your intention towards that you worked on. This is another really kind of interesting um, idea is you hear about this kind of idea of like fighting spirit. I'm fighting against the, can the cancer, you know, that person died and say they lost the battle, the war against cancer. I don't, um, that doesn't resonate with me. And yes, if you're the, if you're got that warrior energy, great. You know, if that feels right for you, great. Do what, do what's right for you. I think I'm more in this kind of feeling like when you're fighting against something, you're kind of causing a stress and then there's like winning and losing. Why not just like be in this space of flowing with whatever happens? It's a more, much more subtle way to kind of focus your life force energy. So less fighting, more of a feeling of strong reason for living. So you focus, put your attention into the things that bring you joy, meaning and happiness. And I also think that, that that does take discipline. That does take um, the sword of loving kindness can chop away the unnecessary, right? The unnecessary, I don't know, committee meetings in, in, in my world or, you know, the relationships that are not serving you that are unnecessary for you. Some, some relationships we're in, other relationships, we don't need to go there. So we take that sword of loving kindness and say, no, I'm going to open up my life. I'm going to put my energy into the things that bring me joy and meaning and happiness. Okay, so I'm going to tell the story of uh, Jeff Eaton. I think I told a little bit of the, the story in a, a previous episode, but uh, I'm sharing this story because the attitude you take can change during your uh, cancer journey. Jeff is also a remarkable survivor who attended a weekend retreat. And his, uh, his chapter in our book is entitled Trading in His Hockey Stick for a Walking Stick. So Jeff, six foot five, he's from um, uh, St. John's, Newfoundland, you, you know, quite a dynamic character, played uh, hockey in high school, was running his own university, uh, he was running his own business in university. And at age 23, he got a diagnosis of acute myelogenous leukemia. So it's a very aggressive blood cancer. And when he first got the diagnosis, he took the attitude that it was like a game of hockey. He was a player and the cancer was the other team type thing. And so when he got his first chemotherapy, he had his hockey stick in hand. So his hockey stick uh, crossed over the IV lines and they would actually drop the puck and he had the, the Toronto Maple Leafs jersey on and so on. And so every time they started the IV, they would drop the puck. And the puck became an image of his kind of soul energy and spirit. Um, and he went to Toronto uh, for bone marrow transplant. So super high dose uh, chemotherapy, you know, lots of adventures there. In fact, one of the, one of the adventures, I just read a little bit from the book because I remember, um, I remember, so it was tough, right? Like the super high dose chemo is super tough. And here's a kind of a, a tapping into the spirit. One night, weakened to the point of despair, he slumped over on the toilet to his left hung his chemotherapy medication dripping in from a big brown bag. On his right, a bag of red cells, which flowed in smoothly. He began to think about never being able to play hockey again. Suddenly, he felt a presence in the room and a tap on his head. A voice from beyond seemed to say, you're going to have to choose one or the other. The brown bag of chemotherapy or the red bag of blood. At that moment, he resolved to choose the vibrant red blood and to choose life. So his spirit was talking to him and saying, what do you want to do? And he said, I want to live. I want to get better. So um, 
as the story goes. So he gets through his transplant. He negotiates with his doctors. They send him home to St. John's, Newfoundland. And then a week later, he gets an infection in his uh, port, in his um, IV access, and he gets super sick. He's sent into the ICU, um, and essentially everything's going terribly. The, the, the organ systems are shutting down. The physicians are saying he has less than 1% chance uh, to live. He still has the puck in his hand. And um, for some reason or other, um, he survives. And uh, he was in a coma essentially for three weeks, wakes up wasted thin, can't even move himself and slowly builds himself up again. So that was, that was the first phase of, you know, this incredibly intense, focused fighting spirit guy going for it. Um, and he, he starts to, uh, starts to run his charity, uh, which was then called real time cancer, subsequently young adult cancer Canada. And two years later, He's saying, an inter- I'll, I'll just read to you, an internal transformation was occurring at this time. Jeff no longer viewed his cancer as an enemy. Quotes, I didn't hate it anymore. I didn't want it dead, just gone. Cancer's my friend, not a friend I want forever, but has taught me so many valuable lessons and helped me develop perspective I would not trade for anything in the world. I began to look at my life more as a journey. I would just take one step at a time. So Jeff had traded in his hockey stick for a walking stick. So he's in this much more peaceful state. And then at the two year point is actually cancer came back, which is like, that's, that's a kind of incurable or very, very unlikely to be cured. And um, he was in this kind of more peaceful grounded state. Um, He went for chemotherapy as an outpatient in Ottawa. So sent to uh, Ottawa to have two transplants in a row and essentially he's been cured of his cancer um since that time and then the the kind of the 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 fun part of the story is that you know with this super high chemotherapy he's basically become infertile right so the chemo affects the uh the sperm cells and so there he's going to the infertility clinic etc etc and he writes that fall my wife and i got in to see the family a sort of fertility doctor begin talking about our options for starting a family We had a great chat, but the doc reassured us that my sperm count is like using birth control. There was no way we'd have children naturally. What the doc didn't know was that over the course of the last four years, I began to love it when the odds were so strongly stacked against me. And he wrote, yes, just after my last super low sperm test, one of my boys beat the odds in a way I've never had before. He heard the start gun and gave her, albeit against a much smaller group of competitors than normal, but that doesn't take away from the victory at all. So obviously Jeff's wife became pregnant. And in fact, he has um, three kids now, um, runs Young Adult Cancer Canada and um, still has the hockey puck in his desk in the day to day. So I tell you the story because it was okay for Jeff to have that kind of fighting spirit at the start. And then there was this transformation of acceptance. Still did all the hard work, but he's in a much more clear state allowing the immune function to work better. So what did Kelly say about this, this last part of this? Uh, so she talked about um, being deliberate about that. In fact, even it sounds a bit more like writing your own obituary, you know, died at age 95, having done this and loving her kids, et cetera, et cetera. And again, this is idea of visualizing what is it you want to manifest, right? So being deliberate, going for it. Make a simple list of the current reasons for living and enjoying your life. And then you want to manifest more of that. Like what is it that brings you joy and connection? The takeaway for me is to bring love into your life, love everything, appreciate everything, let go of the things you can't control. You can't control people's behavior. You can't control what's happening outside in terms of the external environment, but you can be in this incredibly loving state, which is the nurturing state. And we can bring that to each aspect of, you know, even the medical system. Yes, it is a human institution, but the people there are doing their best 
for what they have in that circumstance. So you can, you can love them and appreciate them and just open your heart. And when you open your heart that way, again, you're releasing that kind of energy around that. You want to love your body. Again, like, like a, a young child or a baby, you want to love your body. You feed it, you exercise it, you take care of it. Practice relaxation. And then by settling your mind, nurturing your spiritual life, you're releasing again any sense of tension or um, um, barriers to your own healing journey. I do want to just reflect again. Um, so one of the main books released this year, so uh, Jeffrey Redinger is this um, uh, Harvard-based psychiatrist who also has a Master of Divinity from Princeton Theological Seminary. And so he began interviewing people, again, uh, who've undergone spontaneous remission. So again, looking for the patterns of what people did. They do the work. How do they work at it? So healing the immune system, again, you're releasing the capacity, especially through nutrition, especially through stress reduction, ultimately letting go of the unhappy core beliefs and claiming that deeper true identity, which is in my, in my mind, both, both the physical and the spiritual. So I want to finish off with uh, Anita Morjani's story. So you can see Anita there in the picture on the um, left side. So that was when she was extremely sick from her um, uh, leukemia, lymphoma. Uh, um, so back in uh, about 2000 was when she was, uh, or 2002, she was diagnosed with um, uh, a type of lymphoma that got into the lymph nodes. And for the longest time, almost four years, she refused to have chemotherapy. She tried all sorts of alternative uh, treatments. The tumor kind of waxed and waned, gave her a false impression that uh, things were going well for her. Um, but she just wouldn't accept uh, that medical care. And then she got to a point where she was extremely sick and ill. You know, she had like five centimeter size lumps, uh, you know, as the, as the spots and they were kind of breaking through the skin and so on. And finally, she accepted chemotherapy. And I think she got one or two cycles. Uh, and so between the chemotherapy and the cancer, um, her body was actually just shutting down at that point. So the kidneys were shutting down. Um, she was extremely ill. She was at home. Uh, and she basically said to her husband, you have to take me in. And like, she essentially was dying at that point. And as, they, as she was going into the hospital, she slipped into a coma and at the same time, her kind of consciousness expanded and she was able to, to watch herself and watch the situation. In fact, while she was in a coma, she was in the subsequent days, she was able to listen into conversations in the hallway, um, uh, in, the, in the quarter hallway. So there's no way that she could from a room have listened. And secondly, she was in a coma, but she was able to verify that those conversations happened and um, that her consciousness was able to pick that up. But anyways... So coming into the hospital, she's slipping into coma. Her, her consciousness is expanding. Uh, they bring her in. The oncologist sees her there and uh, says to her husband, the oncologist basically says to her husband, Anita's dying. Like her, her organs are shutting down. And he's like, like the, his facial tone, he starts to cry. And Anita's watching this and saying, it's okay. <laughs> I feel totally fine, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, don't listen to the doctor is what she said. And I'm just going to read again, some of some of her story. So this is on her website. Uh, she explains this near death experience. So I seemed to encompass everything that was happening as though I was slowly merging with it all. I felt no emotional attachment to my seemingly lifeless body as it lay there in the hospital bed. It didn't feel as though I was mine. It looked far too small and insignificant to have housed what I was experiencing. I felt free, liberated, and magnificent. Every pain, ache, sadness, and sorrow was gone. I felt completely unencumbered. Right. So it's a very similar description of the other near-death experiences. So a person can be in pain at the time of their death. As soon as they whoosh, they kind of leave their body, there's absolutely no pain whatsoever. And they feel this kind of tremendous elation. 
The feeling of complete unconditional love was unlike anything I'd known before. It was totally undiscriminating as if I didn't need to do anything to deserve it, nor did I need to prove myself to earn it. And she, she's starting to have this kind of idea as to why she was sick or what, what were her core beliefs were that were holding her back. And then to my amazement, I became aware of the presence of my father who died 10 years earlier. Dad, you're here. I can't believe it. I wasn't speaking those words. I was merely thinking them. In fact, it was more like communicating through the emotions behind the words. And again, that's very consistent with the, um, the near-death experiencers. They're talking with these entities, but it's not a talking. It's just a kind of knowing feeling. I also recognized the essence of my best friend, Sony, who died of cancer three years prior. I seem to know that they're both present with me long before I became aware of them all through my illness. So it's like the spirit guides, you suddenly realize the spirit guides were with you all along. It wasn't just those two spirit guides that she was feeling. And then I was overwhelmed by the realization that God isn't a being, but a state of being. And now I was in that state of being. And then she starts to have this kind of understanding. She gets a kind of a download of, um, you know, the kind of universal perspective. She said, I saw my life intricately woven into everything I'd known so far. My experience was a, like a single strand threaded through the huge and complexly colored images of an infinite tapestry. All the other threads and colors represented my relationships, including every life I touched. There were threads representing my mother, my father, my brother, my husband, and every other person who come into my life, whether they related to me in a positive or negative way. I began to understand that while I may have only been a thread, I was integral to the overall finished picture. Seeing this, I understood that I owed it to myself and to everyone I met and to life itself to always be an expression of my own unique essence. Right. So then she's starting to question, like, why did I get the cancer? Why? What's, what am I missing here? Et cetera, et cetera. So she's questioning. And then she says, well, just look at my, my life path. Why or oh, why was it always so harsh with myself? Why was it always beating myself up? Why did I never stand up for myself or show the world the beauty of my own soul? Why am I always suppressing my own intelligence and creativity to please others? I betrayed myself every time I said yes when I meant no. Right. So she's saying, well, I wasn't in line with the kind of soul uh, energy. And then she describes on, and I'm, I am editing and, and adding some bits here. What sub subsequently happened is incredibly hard to describe. First, it felt as though whatever I directed my attention towards appeared before me. So it's like she thinks it and it appears. Second, time was completely irrelevant, although it didn't exist. And this is a wild one because she says, like, at, at the, at prior to, as, the, as she was being admitted to hospital and, uh, and through the eMERGE and they were drawing the blood work and so on, the blood work was showing that, you know, her kidneys were shutting down and all this, like, very, very dangerous level of chemicals. But she recognized that that report was already written in the past, but in the, in the spiritual realm, it seemed as though the outcome of those tests and the report depended on the decision I had yet to make. So she can make a decision and that would influence what the previous blood tests were actually showing. The decision was whether to live or continue towards into death. If I chose in death, the test results would indicate organ failure. If I chose to come back to physical life, they'd show that my organs began to function again. Right. So if she chose to live, the test would actually change retrospectively, retroactively change. Simultaneously, my father communicated with me. This is as far as you go, sweetheart. If you go any farther, you cannot turn back. So a major decision for Anita at this point. And then she says, I discovered that since I'd realized who I really was and then understood the magnificence of my true self, and if I chose to go back to life, my body would heal rapidly. So she knew that she was going to undergo a spontaneous remission at that point, not in months or weeks, but in days. If I chose to go back to my body, I knew that the doctors wouldn't be able to find a trace of cancer. That stunning revelation hit me as a bolt of lightning. I understood that merely by being who I am truly, I would heal both myself and others. I knew 
that was really the only purpose of my life, to be ourselves, to live our truths, and to be the love that we are. And then she summarizes, and she kind of walks away from this. So she says, this is the divine lesson for the world. Love yourself fully. That's your purpose. That's what you're here to do. And Anita, sure enough, uh, I think it was like a day and a half later, she wakes up out of the coma. She's still sick, but they give her fluids to make sure she's kind of stabilized. And her tumors begin to regress. And ultimately, she's, well, she's still here 14 plus years later, right? Um, and I like that story partly because it points to she did get some chemotherapy and maybe that was the cause of her um, spontaneous remission. It's more likely that something bigger happened there, something that we don't understand, but something that's definitely possible. So I think, I think that brings us pretty close to the end here. So... Um, Right. So uh, I recommend her story um, in the book called Dying to Be Me. It's a profound and important uh, book. And you can go to her website as well, anitamorjani.com. Um, she's lovely, great communicator, wonderful spirit. Um, I want to finish with inviting all of you to a series. Uh, Canadian Cancer Survivors Network is also helping to advertise this. It's called Awakening at Home series. Uh, it's 11 week course every Sunday, 7 to 8, 30 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, and you've already met the co-host, Tim Walker is going to do the majority. Dave McGinley, their hospital reverend is also going to be there. This is a much more kind of experiential course that we're doing with uh, more meditations. There's going to be a home practice, written exercises. So this is really about tapping into your own healing journey and kind of manifesting that, that awakening, that healing uh, through a proactive series. So we hope you can join us. You can sign up through our website uh, there. Um, and I'll stop there and just say info at healingandcancer.org is where you can send an email. We're actually going to reach out to you anyways to, uh, to um, uh, advertise this. And lastly, questions and huge, 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 huge thanks to Canadian Cancer Survivor Network. Um, it wouldn't have been possible. It was really fun to work with Layla and the gang here. And again, thanks everybody for your, your, your spirit and showing up and connecting and helping me learn. And really it's been a, it's been a fun ride this last uh, eight, seven, eight weeks. So I'll stop there. Layla, was there any, um, any um, questions that we should uh, address? Yes, we have um, a few actually in the chat. So first question, how can the compassion message for a more holistic approach to healing be transferred to the broader cancer caregiver and oncologist community? My oncologist has accepted my path, but I continually feel the body mind spirit piece is pushed aside by the majority of specialists. Is there hope that the tide will turn? Mm. Well, there's definitely the hope that this tide will turn. I just, I mean, it's been a 30 year journey for me, right? And, you know, thinking about Nine, the early 90s or late 80s, early 90s, it was like, oh, we have to measure quality of life. Quality of life is actually important to people. So the cancer system like whoosh, woke up, okay, we're going to start measuring quality of life. And then probably late 90s uh, was like, oh, you can exercise and your diet actually has an influence on your cancer. So it was like that consciousness raised again. And then there was the kind of emotional aspects of um cancer care, that we have to recognize that they're the two rails of the train of the physical, emotional, and that, yes, that's, there's probably three rails, but they were slowly understanding that we have to address the emotional needs. And then over the last five to 10 years has been, been brain science, but consciousness is going to be the next, um, the next frontier that we can actually, through our thoughts, imagining that you're breathing through your heart and sending love through your heart, you actually are changing the energy within your body. So that's coming. And as, 
as we as a society wake up to those truths that be slowly integrated into the medical system. And the last thing I would say is that be the change, be the light. Um, you know, as we do these things, as you know, we create these series, um, the, the medical system will slowly adopt that. And I'm also hopeful because the young physicians these days, they're really wonderful people. And they, they've been, they have certain parenting that has also kept them open uh, to changing and open to possibilities. So I'm, I'm optimistic, although it does take time is the takeaway. Thank yeah. you. Uh, next question. Um, I have loved these sessions and find them quite empowering. However, the flip side is that I feel a lot of pressure with my diagnosis to be remarkable. Do you have right. any recommendations around letting go of self-blame in the event of progression? I can imagine that self-blame will be my go-to reaction as if I didn't do enough. Right. Yeah. That's the, it's such a classic and important question. Um, right. So I wasn't a strong enough cancer hero. You know, the cancer hero gets up at 5 a.m. They run 10 miles, they juice carrots and drink carrot juice all day long. And then they're on the internet late at night and they're doing all this stuff for um, you know, try to, to beat their cancer. In the meantime, they can be missing out on their lives, right? So where's the balance? How is it that I can take that beautiful life force energy and make sure that I'm nurturing my relationship, make sure I'm nurturing my, my spirit and, and doing the things that I love to do? And I think that's as important, right? And and then that there's this this paradox that I've been trying to talk about is to is to focus and do those things and and you know be proactive and yet completely let go of the outcome. And so to become more and more comfortable with well the cancer could come back, and if you can kind of visualize that then you're more likely to be able to accepting of whatever happens uh, in the future. So, but it's such a tough one. Like you, if you get a recurrence. It's like, oh, I didn't do it right. Well, we don't know what's going to happen. It's just most important to love as you are right now. That's what I take. I, th I take that away is that you're, you're loving so much right now. That's your focus of your life is so much like that right now that you, it doesn't even matter what's going to happen in the future. You can get yourself into that space. And then, and then there's you no, know, the guilt won't be an issue because you, you did everything. Yeah. It's tough though. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, next question. Can you recommend an online program that will motivate cancer patients to take the radical change in diet journey? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I don't, I don't know about like quotes, a program. Um, but this, this is something that you can really influence your health. And we're, we are so individual that it's important to figure out what works for you. What are the foods that nurture you? What are the foods that give you energy? Go see your, your family doctor, get your blood test done. Like for instance, you want to get a, a vitamin B12 blood test level, right? And so that you'll know where you're at. Uh, so ultimately it's, it's very individual. And so therefore you need to do your own research and so on. As I said, in my dietary one, I think a, a plant-based diet is so extremely important and so you want to take that side as much as possible. And then the only kind of, I'm not sure if it's called a program, but inspirehealth.ca uh, has such fantastic um, resources in terms of dietary stuff. And the other one is um, Gilda's Club in Toronto. And in fact, I'll probably type it in the chat here or um, I'm not sure how to just kind of make sure this is available. Uh, Gilda's Club in Toronto has a community-based cooking program or something like that. Uh, Chef Amy Symington, she's fantastic. So those two programs, Inspire Health and Gilda's Club in Toronto, um, uh, has such 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 great programs. Lots of great diets. Thank you. 